Water, water, everywhere, nor any drop to drink. Good morning, everybody. I'm delighted to be here in Berlin at Fashion Sustain with all of you. So delighted, in fact, that I was moved to quote poetry at you. <laughs> that was a line from Samuel Taylor Coleridge's The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. And he refers, of course, to the oceans, seemingly endless in their volumes, but not a lot of use if you're thirsty. Looked at from space, our planet is indeed, like David Attenborough says, blue. 70% of it is covered in the wet stuff, but almost all of that is salt water, undrinkable. Just 3% of Earth's water is fresh water. So we conserve it and treat it like the absolutely precious commodity that it is, right? Right? Well, we'll come to that later. First, I'd like to shed some light on increasing demand for fresh water. That 3%, it's still here. It circulates, that's the water cycle. It rains, it drains, it evaporates. We don't have less water, but there are more of us who are demanding it. By 2050, demand is projected to increase by 55%. But much sooner, by 2025, the UN says that two-thirds of us could be living in water-scarce regions. Now, <laughs> I'm English, so I'm accustomed to the rain. I grew up soggy, wearing Wellington boots. I was expected to amuse myself during childhood summers <laughs> with something called the Best Rainy Day Book. That was an actual thing. You had to sit indoors and do all these activities. <laughs> And every time I went to Glastonbury, it rained. It simply never occurred to me that water could be scarce. But these days, I live in Australia. It's the driest inhabited continent. And yet, Australians are the highest users of water per capita. It's crazy. We water our lawns with our precious fresh water. We irrigate cotton crops with it. We're in denial because agriculture and industry is demanding more and more water. And climate change is exacerbating droughts, something that down under we've always labored, suffered from. This is a picture of New South Wales, the state in which I live. Parts of the state have been in drought now for seven years. This is actually a bit grim, I'm sorry to share it with you, but last week, just before I came here, the Murray-Darling River Basin was hit by absolute catastrophe. This is a picture of dead fish. A million fish were killed as a result of a blue algae bloom, and that was from over-irrigation and from the drought. Elsewhere in the state, animals are struggling to find water to drink, and they're being mired in the muddy, dry lake beds. And I do apologize for sharing that with you, because I want to talk about positivity. That's what I do with my work. But we do need to look at a problem face on if we're going to have a hope of solving it. This is a bit chirpier. <laughs> Two of my Australian friends, Kath and Kim, run a social enterprise called The Possibility Project. And they design clothing and accessories upcycled from saris. And they have them made in Jaipur, in partnership with an NGO called I India. Now, I India supports street kids and people living in extreme poverty. And they do this in two ways. One is they have a vocational training center, and that's where Kath and Kim have their products sewn. But the other way is with something called the shower bus. Think of a tractor with a big tank of water on the back. And they take this out to the street kids, and Kim told me what it was like to go with them and to see the faces of the children jumping up and down in glee as they're showered with this fresh, clean, beautiful water. It costs just two cents per kid to get that water to them. And yet, the shower bus is a rarity. Kim asked me to share this quote with you. She said, water is a human right, and yet thousands of kids are forced to beg for it or to walk miles to access it. My childhood self 
complaining about the drizzle in Yorkshire, had absolutely no idea. I'm going to suggest to you that many of us, as adults, labor under a similar misapprehension. We turn on the tap, there's water. We don't think about it. We take it for granted. But in 2019, we can't afford to be blasé about water use. And that is why the United Nations has named this decade the Water Action Decade. All right. What on earth has all of this got to do with fashion? Can we, who work in the industry, or even just who buy clothes and who wear clothes, can we make a difference? The answer is a big, fat yes. <laughs> Because you're laughing at me, Patrick Duffy. <laughs> we can actually make quite a lot of impact just starting at home. In 2017, when Stella McCartney teamed up with Clever Care, the labeling system, one of their key messages was just to ask us, do you really need to wash it? Actually, sometimes you can just air a garment, and that will do just as well. We can also hold on to our clothes for longer. This is a stat from RAP in the UK. And they say that by holding on to a garment for an additional nine months after you were going to chuck it out, we can cut its water footprint by 10% and more if it's cotton. All right, but let's face it, it's not us washing our clothes at home that is causing the big problems with the fashion industry. It's actually about washing and finishing garments. That's the lion's share of the problem here. But that's also why us in this room can make a huge difference. It's where brands, decision makers, and designers can change the situation. Now, this slide is an Instagram favorite. I'm sure you've all heard it before. But it can take up to 2,700 liters of water to make your humble cotton t-shirt crackers. Now, when I talk about stats, I always find it really hard to imagine them. Does anyone else feel like that? So think of it as drinking water. How much water do you drink a day? Like two liters? 2.5 if you want to have glowing skin? In that case, your t-shirt took three years of drinking water as an equivalent to produce. What about jeans? Everyone knows this one, right? Your jeans could have taken 10,000 liters of water to make. According to the Global Fashion Agenda's Pulse of Fashion report, in 2015, our industry consumed 79 billion, I was going to say million, billion cubic liters of water in one year. And what does that mean? Close your eyes. Think of an Olympic swimming pool. Now think of 32 million of them. That's right. So the global fashion industry consumes 32 million swimming pools of water every single year just for fashion. OK. I'm going to share with you three stories of inspiration just quickly as to how we can turn this around. Because just because we're used to doing something a certain way doesn't mean that we have to keep on doing it. And the first story is about denim. This is a picture of some Levi's 501s. When I got my first pair around the time that I was going to Glastonbury in the mud, I thought they were the coolest thing on the planet. They're now a lot cooler. In 2007, Levi's decided to look at the environmental impact of a pair of its jeans, and they figured out water use was a huge part of it. They then looked at their processes. They switched out stone washing for a, a system that uses ozone gas. They combined different finishing processes to reduce water, and they committed to using sustainable cotton all of it by 2020, and that means recycled cotton and BT cotton. And they called all this waterless, and doing this, they were able to reduce the water footprint of an average pair of jeans by 28%, but on some styles, by 96%. And in 2016, they made their learnings open source, so anyone can access them. And the second story is about dyes. According to the World Bank, 17 to 20% of industrial water pollution is down to the textile industry. You've all seen those pictures, I'm sure, that Greenpeace put out of waterways outside denim factories that are bright blue. In some places, you can actually predict the colors of next season by looking at the rivers outside of factories. 
enter companies like Spin Dye, who we're going to hear from later today, who figured out how to dye polyester before it spun into yarn, and by doing so, cut water, energy, and chemical use drastically. Enter companies like ColorZen. Have you heard of them? I don't even understand how they do it. But they've figured out a process to alter cotton at the molecular level so that it takes dye more easily. And by doing so, they've reduced the water impact by 90%, they say. Others are using bacteria in order to color garments. There's a woman called Natsai Audrey Chiesa in the UK who's working on this, and she reckons that she can color garments now using minuscule amounts of water, just a cup. And the third story and the last one is about the circular economy. This is one of my big passions. Just before Christmas, I was announced as the first global ambassador for the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's Make Fashion Circular initiative. The big idea behind the circular economy is that we reimagine waste as a resource. Such a beautiful idea. Because why take all these resources, all this precious water, I don't know, trees. We use 150 million trees a year for the viscose industry. Finite resources, so all of the fossil fuels that go into making synthetics. Why take all that, but not just that, the creative resources too, garment workers, designers, everyone in the supply chain. Why take all their creativity, their time and their love and pour into making a garment when we've designed it to be thrown away after just a few wears? It's completely bonkers. We can do it better. <laughs> now, what if we recycled it instead? What if we kept all of those beautiful, precious resources flowing around the system endlessly? Now, you might say, of course we recycle, we're not stupid. Sorry, we are stupid. We only recycle less than 1% of used clothing into new clothing right now. But that's a massive opportunity. And also, it can drastically reduce our water footprint. Now, I don't have time up here to go into all of the incredible innovations being done by NGOs, by designers, by brands, by scientists. But I, many of them are here at Fashion Sustain. And I urge you to go and seek them out, to learn from them, to work with them, to collaborate with them. You know how we always talk about how there's no silver bullet? That's such a cliche, I hate it, but I'm going to use it. Because actually, there is a magic ingredient. We can use this magic ingredient to get together, conserve water, treat it like the precious resource that it is, to thrive within planetary boundaries, to stop gobbling up resources mindlessly, but to consume them with care. And what do you think the secret ingredient is? It's you. <laughs> it's collaboration. I wish you all the best for an incredible conference today. Thank you.